Let's take our Bibles and go over to the book of Jeremiah. We're going to end up in Jeremiah 33, but I want you to start in Jeremiah chapter 7. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 7 this evening. It's a privilege to be here tonight, and I'm just so thankful that so many different churches flew here to hear me preach tonight. I'm just thankful for that. It's a blessing. Jeremiah chapter 7, and if you would, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word, if you're able to, let's stand. Jeremiah chapter 7, I'm going to read a a verse from Jeremiah 7, and then Jeremiah 11, and then Jeremiah 14, and then we'll end up in Jeremiah 33. So follow along as I read. Jeremiah 7, verse 16, the Bible says, Therefore, pray not thou for this people. Neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Now, how horrible does a group have to be for God to tell his prophet Jeremiah to don't even pray for them? Go over to Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah 11, verse 14. Therefore, pray not thou for this people. Neither lift up a cry or a prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out or that they cry unto me for their trouble a second time. Don't even bother praying for them, Jeremiah. They're too long gone. Go over to Jeremiah chapter 14. Verse 11, then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people, for their good. Now this is contrary to what I know the character of God to be. He's telling me to not pray for these people. But aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Let's go over to Jeremiah 33. Verse 1, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. A different verse this time. Call unto me. And I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So we see in Jeremiah three different verses where God's telling his prophet to not pray for the people. And then we reach really a a tipping point in the ministry of Jeremiah when he's in a prison. And God says to Jeremiah, no, call unto me. Call unto me. And if you were continue to read chapter 33 and 34, you will see that almost instantly Jeremiah begins to pray for the people that God told him to not pray for. It's a wonderful wonderful ministry that he has. And tonight I want to take a look at Jeremiah 33. And I just want us to see four definite times from Jeremiah 33 when God reminds us to call on him. When he reminds us to call on him. Let's have a word of prayer. You can be seated. Our Father, Lord, I pray that you'd be with our time and your word tonight. Lord, I pray that you would keep me from saying anything that would quench the spirit from doing his work. I pray, Lord, that you'd limit distractions. There's a lot of people here excited about basketball games and volleyball games, and Lord, they should be. But Lord, tonight I'm asking you to help us put that aside and be excited about your word. And Father, we'll give you glory for how you choose to use it. Help us to apply our hearts to your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Jeremiah was a prophet during the time of Josiah the king. He prophesied about 60 years after Isaiah and just before Ezekiel and Daniel. And we have three instances where God tells him to to not pray, not pray, not pray for these people. But when he comes down to it, he looks at Jeremiah as Jeremiah is shut up into a prison and he says to him, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And that has been a verse that has encouraged literally thousands and thousands and thousands of believers through the ages. 
How many times have you claimed that verse, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not? How many times in times of uh, uh, turmoil and trouble and seasons of distress, you've, you've remembered that verse and you've recalled it and you've even quoted it, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. It's been a wonderful verse to remind us of the grace of God. Several years ago, I read a story about a, a young man that was in a Bible college, and he was wrestling with this whole concept that so many Bible college students wrestle with. He was in a relationship. And I'm sure if you're a college student tonight, you might be able to, to identify with this type of relationship because it was one of those on-again, off-again relationships. Together for a month and one semester, not together for two months, and back together for a month. Off for the next semester, back together for the semester, the next semester. And it was an on-again, off-again relationship. And, and this particular man, he really felt that this was the young lady that, that the Lord wanted him to marry. But I guess she wasn't so sure about that. And even his friends would tell him, he'd say, you're crazy. Why don't you just move on? He's like, I believe this is the one. And one day he was just ventured out, uh, just outside of the college campus there in the area. And he found an old railroad car that was abandoned. And he went into the railroad car and he made that place his place of prayer. And he began to pray specifically for this relationship. Lord, if this is, if this is the, the lady that you have for me, make it happen. I'm trusting you. I'm leaving it in your hands. And he went there every day. Some of his friends noticed at the same time every day he disappeared. And so they followed him and they started following him. And they could hear him from outside the car praying for this relationship. And there came a time where maybe they were poking fun at him a little bit until, until they realized that it worked. They realized that, that they started getting together and seeing each other again. And, and sure enough, he had called her father and asked for permission to ask her uh, to marry him. And he did ask her and she said yes. And his friends started calling that railroad car the Pennsylvania powerhouse. In fact, some of his friends even started visiting it routinely on their own to see if they could pray the same thing. Some of you are wondering right now if Dr. Getch and Dr. R could somehow get one of those outside the campus here. <laughs> but it was called the Pennsylvania Powerhouse. And I know, I know that uh, prayer is something that's emphasized. But I wonder if it's something that we do like we ought to. I wonder if it's something that we actually engage in routinely like we ought to. It's sad and tragic that sometimes we only have a prayer life when it's convenient for us or perhaps when we need something. The problem with treating prayer uh, like it's something that we go to just when we need something is that we're treating God as if he's a genie in a bottle and we can just rub that lamp of prayer anytime we need something and, and then the genie's supposed to say, poof, what do you need? Poof, what do you need? The problem with that is that that makes us the master and him the servant. We're not the master, he is. He's the master. And prayer is often the forgotten aspect of our quiet time with the Lord. You know, we all have goals for our Bible reading. Maybe you set out a goal this year to, uh, to read the Bible through once in a year, or maybe it's twice in a year. At our church currently right now, we are engaging in a program called 66 Books in 66 Days, and we're trying to get as many people in our church to read through God's Word in 66 days. And it's a wonderful thing to engage in Bible reading. But oftentimes, the forgotten aspect of our communion with Christ is our prayer life. Do you realize this evening... That prayer is access to God's omnipotence. It's access to God's omnipotence. Consider these thoughts about prayer. Ian Bounds said, Taking, uh, talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to God for men is greater still. He said, I would rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Samuel Chadwick said, the devil fears nothing from prayerless toil, prayerless label, or, or prayerless study. But when the weakest saint is upon his knees, all hell trembles. And prayer is important for us, and we ought to understand that this evening, because you cannot live for God apart from prayer. 
You, you cannot be an effective student apart from prayer, whether you're in high school or you're in college. You cannot be an effective student apart from prayer. You cannot have an effective relationship with other people apart from prayer or a godly relationship apart from prayer. You cannot raise a family apart from prayer. You cannot be an effective uh, employee at work apart from prayer. You cannot reach people with the gospel apart from prayer. You cannot reach God apart from prayer. And in our text, Jeremiah is in prison. The lamenting prophet is experiencing captivity in this text. But God has a message for Jeremiah concerning prayer. Jeremiah, he's in prison. And God had already encouraged him in, in the previous chapter, Jeremiah 32. But, but then God comes to him in chapter 33. And he gives him perhaps the greatest encouragement of all, the same words that have encouraged, again, believers through the ages, and it's this, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And this evening, I just simply want us to answer this question tonight. When do we call on him? When do we call on him? Look at verse one, and let's see the first one. The Bible says in verse 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison. While he was in prison. Now, I'm not a, an expert in law enforcement or an expert in prison life, but I'm pretty sure that the implication is when you're in prison, you really don't have anywhere else you can go. In fact, Scripture says that he was shut up in the prison. I mean, isn't that the point of a prison? To keep you captive? To hold you hostage? And here, Jeremiah, the Bible says, he was in this prison and there was no place for him to go. He couldn't go anywhere else. And I read verse 1 and I think to myself, when do we call on the Lord? When did God give instruction to Jeremiah to call on him? When he was in prison, which tells me this, you call on the Lord when you've got no place else to go. You call on the Lord when you've got no place else to go. Now, I want to caution us because sometimes that's the only time we call on the Lord. And it, not, it ought not be the only time we call on the Lord. But I'm thankful that he gives us instruction that we should call on him when we've got no place else to go. He was shut up in prison and he had no place else to go. Hey, have you been there before? Have you been in a situation where really in, in, in the recesses of your heart and your spirit, you felt like you had no place else to go? I, I, I can't talk to my friend about it. I, I have a difficulty talking to some of my authority about it. I have a hard time talking to my parents about it. Well, you know what God says when you've got no place else to go? He says, call unto me. Call unto me. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. And the God of heaven the creator of the universe, as he qualifies it there in verse two, the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah. The Lord is his name. He said, when you've got no place else to go, he said, call unto me, call unto me. But not only should we call on him when we've got no place else to go, I want you to notice another verse. Look down at verse four. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, listen to this, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. Their, their inhabitants, their places of inhabitant had been, had been upended, had been uprooted. Their houses had been overturned. And, and here, here is the concept. Not only did Jeremiah have no place else to go, but his city, there was nothing left there. He had nothing else. And I can't help but think that God's telling the prophet to call on him not only when he's got no place to go, but number two, when he's got no payment to give. When, when he has no payment to give. We call on him when we have nothing to give. You ever had too much month at the end of the money? Several years ago, I was uh, taking a tour of the Reagan Library, not too far from here, and, and I was reading a little section of one of his, his, uh, President Reagan's diaries, and I read that and said, I'm going to use that. That's, that's pretty good. 
I'm sure you've been in that situation where you've had too much month at the end of the money. How am I going to pay that next bill? How's this financial situation going to be taken care of? Uh, taken care of? And you think to yourself, and even claim Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And, and by the way, just be careful before you claim that verse, put it in its context. Amen. You know, th th that verse is in the context of giving. Right. But if you've been doing what God has asked you to do and you've been a good steward with the finances and resources that he's given to you to steward and you've got no more payment to give, if you will. God said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You see, God promised to meet our needs, but he never promised he'd use our paycheck to do it. But I just don't know how God's gonna do this. I'm not sure how he's gonna do that. And I'm a little concerned. I'm not worried because worried sin, so I'm gonna spiritualize it, I'm just concerned. I'm just a little concerned about how this is going to happen. I know we normally do this. Uh, uh, typically, if we ask this question, we ask it at the end of the service. But it's a Wednesday night, and there's nobody here but us. So I'm just going to ask it now. How many of you know for sure you're saved and you're on your way to heaven? Raise your hand. Man, praise the Lord. You can put your hands down. I'm concerned, though, about that money thing. So let me get this straight. You're willing to trust God with your eternity, but you're not willing to trust God with your today. If you can trust God with eternity, can't he be trusted for today? And God says when you've got no payment to give, and you've been stewarding the resources that I've given to you, and you've not robbed me, he says, when you've got no payment to give, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. So when do we call on him? Number one, when we have no place to go. Number two, when we have no payment to give. Let me give you a third one. Number three, when you have no passion to gird up. When you have no passion to gird up. Look at verse five of Jeremiah 33. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I have slain in mine anger and in my fury. And for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from the city, behold, I will bring it health and cure and I will cure them and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. It sounds like the, the battle that's going on here, it's a lost cause for somebody. It's, it says here that it's to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I've slain in my anger. And let me just make this point of application here. You ever been to that point in your life where spiritually you're just so drained? You don't feel like you can go on? Maybe you said, God, I, I've got no more strength to continue on in this fight. I've got no more strength to continue on in this battle. I've got no more strength to strap on the armor of Ephesians 6. You've asked me to strap on all these different armor pieces, and I've got no more strength to gird up with the armor. And God says this. Uh, when, when you have no more passion to put on that armor, when you have no more passion to gird up and go through the day and continue fighting uh, for me, he says this, call unto me and I will answer thee Amen. and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Psalm 18, 31 and 32 says, for who is God save the Lord or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and, take, and maketh my way perfect. He taketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. Psalm 27, one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 29, 11, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Psalm 46, one, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Psalm 68, 35, the God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So Proverbs 10, 29, the way of the Lord is strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my strength is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness where I am weak, he is strong. I don't have any passion to gird up, God. 
I don't have any passion to keep going. I, I, I can't get the, the breastplate of righteousness on this morning. God, I can't, I can't allow my feet to be shod with the gospel, the preparation of peace. I've been going and I've been going and I've got no more strength to fight. And God says, when you've got no passion to gird up, he said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. Call on me when you've got no more passion to gird up and keep fighting. But let me show you another one. Look at verse eight. The Bible says, and I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. I'm so thankful for the cleansing offered in this verse. But do you know what I'm reminded of as I read verse eight? I'm reminded of how sinful and wicked I am. I'm reminded of how unrighteous and ungodly I am. And I can't help as I read God telling us to call unto him that he wants us to call him when we've got no place to give and no payment to give and no, uh, pa no payment to give, no passion to gird up. But he also says this, I want you to call unto me when you've got no position to glory in. When you've got no position to glory in, because while I am so thankful of the cleansing that's offered in verse number eight, again, it reminds me of how wicked I am. It reminds me of how unrighteous I am. And when we pray, we are entering into a place that we have no business being. That's right. We're so sinful. And we're entering into the throne room of God. We don't have any rightful position to burst into the throne room of heaven making demands of God. And then my mind drifts to another prophet, Isaiah. In chapter 6, when he finds himself standing in the throne room of God. And he hears the seraphim circling the throne room of God saying, holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah is confronted with the holiness of God, he has one response and it's this, woe is me, I don't belong here. I have no, I have no proper standing to be here. I shouldn't be here. He says, I'm undone. And I can't help but think when Isaiah first, when he says, I'm undone, and woe is me, what is this deep, dark sin that's he's, that he's hidden, that he's kept back, that he's not confessed? Is it adultery? Is it murder? What has he done? And then he says this, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I just got to tell you, I'm thinking, that's not so bad. In, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a sin that we would elevate to other sins, but I'm telling you, in the eyes of a holy God, sin is sin. Right. And we've got no position to glory in, and we've got no rights to make demands of God and go into his throne room. But I love the fact that God has told us, even though we've got no position to glory in, he said, call unto me. And not because of anything that we did. We don't deserve to go into the throne room of God, but here it is, as a child of God, Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us on the cross, took his robe of righteousness and he put, a, put it on us and now I can stand in the throne room of God, not because I'm holy, but because Jesus is holy and God the Father sees me as holy because I've accepted, accepted him as my savior. And he sees me as holy. I've got no position to glory in though. I glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ because I'm a man of unclean lips. But because of what Jesus Christ did for me, I can read a verse like Hebrews 4, 16, and come boldly unto the throne of grace so that I can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And even though I've got no position and I've got no right to go into the throne room of grace, God said, call unto me. And he didn't just say, call unto me. He said, come boldly. That means I don't go sheepishly. Now, we ought to go humbly, obviously. But how many times have you prayed thinking, God, if it's not too much trouble, God, if I'm, if it's, if, if, if I'm not bothering you right now, I would challenge you to find a place in Scripture where someone prays like that. 
We've got no position to glory in, but because of Jesus Christ, we can come boldly into the throne of grace. And even though we've got no position to glory in, God says, call unto me. Even though you've got no right to ask, call unto me. When you've got no place to go, when you've got no payment to give, when you've got no passion to gird up, when you've got no position to glory in, the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee. And so I have a question for you tonight. How's your communion with God? You know, if you're a college student here tonight, you do Bible reading quite a bit for a lot of your classes, I'm sure. But, but how's your communion? And let me emphasize another aspect of that. How's your prayer life? How, how's your prayer life? Several years ago when Morgan, my daughter Morgan, she's 17, she's here with me tonight, but several years ago when she was just learning how to play the piano, um, her grandmother sent her a little keyboard that you roll, you unroll it, and she was practicing on that. Hot cross buns, whatever it was. And she kept playing the piano, and then she got a little keyboard and was playing that, and her teacher, Mr. Wagner, came to me and my wife one day and said, you know, Morgan's getting to the point we need to get her a, a real feel piano. I said, you, I'm thinking to myself, he has no idea how much assistant pastors make. <laughs> it's like, you need to get a real feel piano. You need to get a piano. I said, okay, well, we'll, we'll be praying about it. About that time, the church that I was serving at, the pastor said, hey, we've got this piano. Nobody ever plays it. Won't you see if somebody wants to take it in the church or try to sell it, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be great. And I instantly formulated the plan because I was going to go home and I was going to talk to Morgan. I was going to say, Morgan, we're going to start praying for a piano. And I've already, I've already got the plan to help God. <laughs> it's already there because we're going to pray for the piano. And, and then a couple weeks later, God's going to provide the piano. And I've, I've already got it all planned out. And we're going to make, we're going to make God the hero. But I've got the plan. It's good. It's foolproof. And so I had my plan ready. And Morgan and I, we start praying about a piano. And we make it a matter of prayer with the family. We're praying about a piano. Mr. Wagner says to me one day when I'm picking her up from piano lessons, he says, hey, a lady called me. And she's getting rid of a piano. And I told her about my student, Morgan. And she really wants you to come over and, and take a look at the piano. And instantly I start thinking, okay, that's very kind of her, but I've already got the plan figured out. You don't understand. This is good. I mean, I'm going to show her the power of God. And the piano at the church, I mean, it was nice. It was serviceable, but it was the typical upright piano at an independent Baptist church that pastors are trying to get rid of. <laughs> you know, a couple of keys are stuck down in the down position all the time. But that was the solution that I had for God. And so out of loyalty, really, to the piano teacher, we went over to this neighborhood, this nice neighborhood, and pulled into this uh, parking, or into this driveway, and met him there, and knocked on the door, and this lady answered, and she immediately looked at Morgan and said, you must be Morgan. And Morgan, I don't remember how old you were at the time, six years old or so, and Morgan... And so she says, well, come on in. And she comes in, and I look to my left in this room, and there's an upright piano against the wall. And it looks similar to the one that was at the church. And she says, I've got a piano that I want to show you. And I'm thinking to myself, man, we wasted a trip out here because uh, the piano at the church is probably just as good as this one. And she said to us, would you like to see the piano? And we said, yes, we'd like to see the piano. And she said, okay, well, follow me. And I turned left, and I went into that room, and I went to that upright piano, and I turned around, and nobody else was with me. And so I turned back around and I walked out of that room and I, I looked down the way and, and I, saw him standing next to, I saw him standing next to a different piano, only this piano was different. It was a baby grand piano. It had three legs and it wasn't an upright. And I walked over to that piano. I'm thinking, why is she teasing her with this piano? That's not okay. Just bring her back in here and show her this one. That's not okay. And, and she sat down, that lady sat down on the piano and she played a little bit and 
She looked up at Morgan and said, Morgan, would you like to play it? And Morgan sat down and she started playing. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not okay. I, I, don't, I don't want her to be confused. And then, and then the lady looked at Morgan and said, Morgan, if it's okay with, if it's okay with your parents, you can have this piano. Amen. I'm thinking to myself, wait, I already had the plan. I had a good one. I said, I already had the plan. It's like, if it's okay with your parents, you can have this piano. She even had it paid. She even paid to have it professionally moved to our house. Retuned when it got there. Turns out God's plan's better than mine. A couple weeks later, Morgan and I are sitting at the piano. I don't even know if she would remember this. But we're sitting at the piano and she's playing. And I kind of under my breath gasped something like this. Man, I can't believe this. And Morgan stopped playing and she said, you can't believe what, Daddy? I was hoping maybe she didn't hear me. But I said, sweetie, I just, I just can't believe we have this piano. And she said this. She said, why not? We prayed for it. This was supposed to be my lesson to her, <laughs> not her lesson to me. Man, we've got a powerful God. And prayer is our access to his omnipotence. And I learned a lesson that day. And the lesson was this. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Because he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen. Well, I've got a plan. He's got a better one. College student, you might think that you've got a great plan. I promise you God's is better. Amen. High school student, you may think you've got a great plan. I promise you God's is better. Amen. John R. Rice said all of our failures are prayer failures. John Bunyan said you can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Hey, how's your communion with God? How's your prayer life? 